King. What is up, everybody? Thank you for joining me. This is Jay Dumont, bringing you the real episode 9 of Let's Nerd with Pathfinder Kingmaker. So, we have a lot to do in today's episode, and um, we've got to uh, get right to it. So, unfortunately, I'm going to have to make a trip back to Oleg's because I don't really want any more beef with kobolds down here. Or do I? Do I think I can weed these kobolds out like one by one? Let's give it a shot, shall we? Let's see what happens. I would like to see what's down here. See, there's a bag. Apologize for the noise. Let's see, we got some loot. And we, we want to... What's this? Cobalts have turned the skull of a dragon-like creature into an object of worship. Push, push, you slugs. What are they pushing? I wonder. Um... The reason I have to head back to Oleg's is because I'm once again out of camping rations because Asirius decided to have a nightmare and ruin everything. But I think maybe if we get lucky. What you want? <clears throat> excuse me, I can uh, maybe survive these battles down here. And maybe loot the place and almost finish up I'll go ahead. Uh, these caverns. And then there would just be the three skeletons in the secret room to deal with, but I kind of want to... I'm not afraid! Yeah. Yes. Alright, so... see if we can do this. Various charge the alchemist. Valerie. Charge the sentinel. Octavia shoot the alchemist. Mary charge the alchemist. Lindsay sing a song of courage. Nice. Me. Spell failed. Awesome. Awesome. The archer, but don't attract the others. Alright, now stop. I'll come back here. Lindsay, stop singing. So if we can kind of piece our way through these kobolds as is, it'd make it a lot better heading back to Oleg's with more loot. Because I'd like to buy the small bag of holding and then um, carry a bunch more rations for when I'm in places like this. So there was a bone shaman there and didn't even see it. Shield of Faith. So we have some stuff we can use to survive down here against kobolds. There's something crazy going on outside. I don't know what it is. What's this? Paintings made with soot. It seems like they're supposed to portray dragons, but most just look like cows with wings. The path is clear. Well, the path isn't really clear. There's a lot of enemies up here. Kobolds seem to be good at carrying hides and decorating their caves with them. So we know there's two flame shamans up here, and that's bad news because they cast magic missile. So, let's see, Letharius has a potion of shield of faith. We have scrolls of shield of faith, so let's use those. Alright, 
so let's see if we, we can do this. Prepare. His luck turns off after battle two, which is cool. Let's use uh, lead blades. If we can, there we go. Let's give a shield of faith to Valerie. Let's give a shield of faith to Amiri, who needs it. So difficulty class 11 seems pretty good for him. Give a shield of faith to yourself, sir. You can cast those. Alright. A little closer. Too bright. All right, so we've got two bone shamans here, so I think we can do this. Give if we, the order. If we approach it correctly. And that is charge the heck out of these bone shamans. The road awaits. So, is there anything else we can use? Uh, Jayathal. Share your will. Oh, leading touch is pretty cool. She has six of those. Hmm. Octavia is pretty much out of spells, but she can use Hurricane Bow. Ah, and use that. All right, so let's try this. Here I am. See. Charge that one. You have my attention. Charge that one. Octavia, shoot that Consider one. Consider me provoked. Anything is Lindsay, possible. Sing a song of happiness. Did I choose Valerie yet? Rush that one. Ready? Go! <clears throat> awesome. Get him. Body holds no more. This is for We're you. good. I, I don't know why she insists on using Acid Splash so much. We're good. See, she keeps defaulting to Acid Splash. Am I going to have to turn AI off? We did it. I don't know what they were pushing. A little help from my friends. Scroll of False Life. You harness the power of Unlife to grant yourself a limited ability to avoid death. While the spell's in effect, you gain temporary hit points equal to 1d10 plus 1 per caster level. Huh, that's new. Caster level 3. Color Spray. Some more 100 gold crossbows. So I don't know what they were doing exactly up here. But I don't really care. Scroll of Vanish. Some trinkets. Ooh, a 70 crystal ball. Jayathal, you notice anything interesting? And I guess that's it for the kobolds now. See anything really worth else taking here? Tread lightly. So the only thing left down here that I can think of are the three skeletons, but I don't think it's worth coming back. Um, well, I'm gonna go to Oleg's, right? I have to go back this way. I'm going to rest up. I'm going to buy the bag of holding and a bunch of uh, camping rations. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk to the Might Queen too. And tell her I got rid of Chief Soot Scale. And also found the Might Relic.
And I think the mites stole the cobalt relic. So they should have both relics. And my ultimate fear here is that I just don't want to waste too much time. Down here, like killing skeletons when important things need to be done. If at the end of the chapter I have time left over, which I should, or when I come back down here to open Sycamore Hall with the, uh, with the, um, relics. Then uh, I'll try that skeleton fight. It should be a lot easier now that Jathal can just disrupt undead. And um, Octavia can use telekinetic fist. I'll go ahead. <clears throat> Dispose of those other skeleton champions in the previous episodes. So there's going to be some running around here. I apologize if it's not the most interesting. But we got to do what we got to do. I'm playing the game the way that the designers developed pretty much. Except for Death's Door. Because I feel like... <clears throat> it would just be too difficult at this point. Am I in the new area? No. Where's the Night Queen? Up more. Oh, we're in a bad storm, so we're moving slowly. Lightning's gonna start striking. Wonder if it can hit your characters. It probably can. But, um... Death's Door would just require a little more reloading and... Uh, taking off Death's Door, I should say. Will just require a little more uh, loading. Like, I wouldn't have been able to beat that centipede fight. I would have had three characters dead. And, uh, you know, it's just a little thing to kind of. I know it's kind of like cheating a little bit. But I figure Death's Door, it makes sense, kind of. Because it's like, you took a critical blow. And you're in a critical condition, you know? You're really, really hurt bad. And because you're really hurt bad, the next the next blows are going to kill you. And those are the deaths that I'm gonna live with. If someone dies by critical uh, after death's door, then that then I'm gonna live with that. I'm not gonna reload. Even if the game gets harder, because I remember I do have Harem who can replace someone. And I do have uh, Ragongar. So it would give you an incentive to use other party members. Which I'm cool with. And I want to play it as close to, the, to how the developers intended. Which I think I am so far. But, um... You know, I'm, I'm getting a grip on the game a bit more. Right, how do I get to that queen's chamber? This way. And down. Hopefully this levels us up, so I can do a level up in this episode. And hopefully not screw it up too bad. See, the thing with playing on challenging too, your builds need to be not perfect. The next level up, they warn you that your builds have to be near perfect to survive. But your builds are going to have to be good. I can't screw up the builds too much. And everything I take, I have to make sure I'm going to use it. So let's report to the Might Queen here. Bada. Hello, lovely lady. Um, let's just in case <clears throat> get some guidance. Just letting the ink dry. 
have her inspire competence in case there's any skill checks Everyone in dialogue. Counts on me. Like diplomacy or something. Her ma Her Majesty Warrior, Queen Bada, welcome, ally her chamber. It is done. I've defeated Chief Sootscale. Sweet! I reward and honor you, ally. Now I ready big attack and cut all kobold. Only wait you catch purple hide. My guard lets you to the door, but you need relic. There are two. One have purple hide. Where a second I know not. Think Cobalt Chief. Okay. Anything is possible. We didn't level up. We're about a thousand the away. Is clear. So am I missing the Cobalt relic? I'm just gonna quick save and see if I can open this door. I can. Alright, so load that quick save. I'm not going to go in there just yet. Because if Purple Hyde is in Sycamore Hall and there's going to be an encounter with him, I want to be at full strength. So he opened the door with his relic or whatever, and the ones that the Cobalt stole. Is this, does this go outside? No. I have to go back that way. So that's what happened. He stole the Mites Relic. He got inside Sycamore Hall. The Kobold still had the Relic with Chief Soot Scale. We got that back and now we can get inside Sycamore Hall. But if that's where Tartuk or Tartuccio as we believe him to be, is, then, uh, if there's a fight that ensues, we're gonna wanna be prepared for that. And right now, we are not prepared for much of anything. <clears throat> I may be being overcautious, but I think what I'm doing is gonna be a good idea. At least we'll have camping rations and stuff like that. Now I could come out here and I could rest and hunt rather than go to Oleg's. And I'm wondering if that's what I should do. Oleg's is a guaranteed 8 hour rest though. Sometimes hunting takes 16 hours or stuff like that. How much time do I have left? I spent 21 days so far, almost a month, chasing Tartuccio. Because he's trying to unearth some nastiness I'll go ahead well, hopefully we don't get in too many crazy random encounters on the way back I wonder if we hunt elk if we get rations or just meat I don't want to kill the elk though I'm softy. Uh. All right, so give me a second here. I haven't even been to Thorn Ford yet, and a month has almost passed, but that's okay. Actually, if we just click all legs, it will take nine hours. That's not bad. A nine hour trip is not bad, as long as we don't get hit with a random encounter. Perfect. If those trips took like days, then it'd be a lot worse, but. Headphone wires bumping my mic here. With a delighted smile, Octavia inhales the smell coming from Oleg's trading post. Fresh bread, I can't believe it. All this time we sat in cages and crawled in the mud, there were places in the world where they were baking fresh bread. And here we are. I bet they have clean sheets, and maybe we can even take a bath. Haha, <laughs> a girl can dream. Get some rest, you deserve it. 
You can be sure of that. I've got years of rest to catch up on, and I'll be stuffing my face until I turn into a ball. You do so much for us. Is it because you are kind? Or maybe, the half-elf smiles flirtatiously, maybe it's because you've been charmed by my beauty? Exactly. I would have never found the Technic League's encampment if your beauty hadn't beckoned me. Beaconed me. Octavia laughs out loud. For a moment, something more than just friendliness flashes across her eyes. Oh, you are so sweet. All right, enough talk. Fresh bread and clean sheets await. So it seems Octavia can be a love interest. Even though she's kind of with Ragongar. First things first, let's... Sell some of this junk. Where's my ma oh we have the maces equipped, alright. Breastplate, 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 chain mail, chain shirt, chain shirt, chain shirt. Should I sell the chain shirt plus one? Light armor. Ragongard can probably use that. Actually, let's look. He's just got a regular chain shirt. But will I be using Ragongar right now is the question. What is that? Topaz ring. Some artificial flowers. Ole can decorate with a crystal ball. Svetlana can read into the future. Oh, and I have been neglecting cooking. Cooking is actually very good. Uh, shout out to Purple Blob from RPG Watch for showing me what cooking can do. Uh, you get some really nice buffs. You can get plus one to saving throws for the team. You can get plus one to... Um, attack rolls for the team, movement speed, so there's a lot you can get. The recipes just aren't clear until you make them, what they do. And we're going to be able to buy that bag of holding. Make sure that's what I want. He's got a light mace plus one. I think the bag of holding, the sooner you get it, will pay for itself. Yeah, we'll bring up protection too. Three sixty six. Let's get rid of some of these scrolls. Burning Hands, that's only 1d4 points of damage per level. Caster level 1, caster level 1. Let's get rid of the ones we know we really aren't going to use. one d 4 plus 1 of force, it's just caster level 1. So I think I'm going to sell that. One round per level, caster level one. Caster level one, but snowball's good. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Um, Regongar. with us too. Harem's wearing chain mail, so he's fine. You know, I think I'm just gonna sell that. Uh, how 
much is he asking for a chainmail plus one? 1250. <clears throat> Just hang on to it for now. So this is going to give us... The bag of holding opens into a non-dimensional space. Its inside is way larger than its outside dimensions. Regardless of what's put in the bag, its weight doesn't change. It allows the party to carry additional 100 pounds of weight without suffering negative consequences. So let's deal that. So all that does... <laughs> you don't actually put things in the bag. It just gives you another 100 pounds to carry. Excuse me, I've got the hiccups here. So while we're here, we're going to be doing some chatting. Let's try to find our new party members. Let's try to find Harem. And talk to him. And, uh... Octavian Raganga. There's Harem. So let's learn about Harem. The sad dwarf. Harem pulls his beard, muttering something that could either be prayers or curses. Upon noticing you, he winces. Eh, uh, what? Oh, it's you, Assyrius. Did I startle you? I'm sorry. Oh no, that doesn't matter. I was just contemplating the futility of existence and the worthlessness of the universe. The ways of Groatus are great. My humble mortal mind cannot fully grasp them, but I do what I can. Harem smiles apologetically. Grotus. Grotus is the god of the end times, a sentient and cruel moonlit that looks down upon the boneyard and waits for the last living soul to die. When Phrasma judges the last soul after the last living body dies on the material plane, Grotus will descend to the boneyard and move on to the material plane to clean up and pack the dust away for another reality. No one really knows what Grotus is going to do once the last soul is judged, but it's generally accepted that it will not be pleasant. Interesting. I like learning about the gods and stuff. Tell me about your past, Harem. My life is divided into two parts. The first was filled with blind wandering, doubts, and attempts to serve Torag. The second part began when I accepted Grotus into my soul and received a clear vision of the world. What exactly would you like to know? So Torag, also known as Father of Creation, is a stoic and serious dwarven god of the forge, protection, and strategy who values honor planning and well-made steel. He is an often distant deity, lending magical power to his clerics, but leaving his followers to make their own way through life, knowing that this will make them strong and determined. Or in Grotus' case, I mean Harem's case, turn him to Grotus. Where are you from, Harem? My life story began in Larad, a city of dwarven clerics and acolytes. They served Torag and the other dwarven gods, Torag's brothers Angrad and Magram, Torag's wife Fulgrit, his daughter Bolka, his sons Grundinar, Coles, and Trud, and also Torag's sister, Drangvit. Harem curves his lips in contempt. I wouldn't be surprised if they built a temple to Torag's pet dog. Sorry, I let myself get carried away. Harem sighs and pulls his beard several times. Larad is the second largest dwarven city in the Five King Mountains. It's built up around numerous temple caverns which serve as places of worship for all the dwarven gods. Many pilgrims from every corner of Galarian come to Larad to pray to their gods. Some remain to live there. So the Five King's Mountains are tall and imposing peaks, rich with ore and iron blue mushrooms. Heavily populated by dwarves, they're the largest center of dwarven culture on or beneath Galarian. High Helm, the largest dwarven city on Galarian, is located under one of its peaks. This city is simply imbued with faith. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting a cleric. It's no surprise, inspired by the aura of this city, that I decided as a young boy to dedicate all my efforts to becoming a cleric of Torag. You once tried to serve Torag? Not just tried, it was a burning passion. I craved it by day and dreamt of it at night. Harem shakes his head as if amazed by his own stupidity. You see, Assyrius, from my first days I felt the presence of the god at my back. I heard his whispers and felt his power, though the nature of this power was unclear to me. I thought Torag himself was trying to speak to me, and I did all I could to understand his words. 
Oh, what a naive fool I was. I had no idea that Torag, that uncompromising, conceited god, glamorized by all dwarves, was capable of betrayal. He turned away from me as serious. He left me in the hour when I put all my hopes in him and desperately needed his support. Torag is the god of craftsmanship, so every follower, especially the clerics, must smith their own suit of armor. The day when this work is finished is like the second birthday for a dwarf. He's newly born in the eyes of Torag. Harem sighs heavily and falls silent for a time. My second birthday never came. I couldn't make armor, not even a sword, not even a simple nail. My hammer smashed my fingers and fell on my feet. Molten iron burned my hands. The clerics laughed as they healed me. They used to say I was cursed by Torag, so finally I gave up any attempt to please the betrayer god. See, but Torag leaves his followers to find their own ways, so Harem had to find his own way that didn't involve blacksmithing and being a cleric, so in a way he kind of did, but he's serving Grotus now. Even if Torag really has rejected you, is that enough reason to leave your homeland? You don't know much about dwarves. Harem lets out a sad sigh. How can a dwarf cursed by Torag go on living in a city where every single soul bows to Torag? I was alone, disgraced, humiliated, insulted. A lone tear glints in the light before sliding down Harem's cheek and hiding in his beard. I was trying to drown my sorrows in drink, but even the owner of the cheapest pub on the road would laugh at me while he put those mugs in front of me. I couldn't take it any longer. I wanted everything to end. But there was one thing that kept me going and prevented me from ending my life. I could still hear that divine whisper behind my back. It was yet faint. It took a long time before I could hear it clearly. But having heard it once, I could never forget it. It was clear that none of Lared's de deities favored me, so I left the Five Kings Mountains and went out searching. I didn't think dwarves ever worshipped Grotus. How did you learn about him? Oh, but, a, but that blessed day became the beginning of a new life. Alone and abandoned by all, I spent many dull hours in a filthy tavern by the roadside. I don't recall the town nor even the country. I had no money. In fact, all I had was a hunk of stale bread. I was weary and almost fainting from hunger. And that was the moment when the whisper from my god became more clear. It was like he was calling me. At last, my sufferings had come to an end. It was a miracle of Sirius, and I had paid full price for it with my torments. I couldn't control myself. I walked out of the tavern and straight into the nearest forest, and there I found the ruined temple of Erodin, the lost god. Several figures clad in robes were holding a silent service there, a service to a god I knew nothing of. None minded when I stood beside them. For the first time in my life, I felt myself at home. So Orodin was the immortal Aslanti who raised the star stone from the bottom of the inner sea in one AR. And in doing and in so doing founded the city of Absalom and ascending to godhood. Prophecy told of his return to Galerion and the beginning of a new age of glory. On the eve of his return, however, his clerics were cut off from his power and terrible storms racked the world. Now presumed dead, Orodin's demise ushered in the current age of lost omens. My new brothers told me they were clerics of Grotus, the god of end times. They were traveling around Galarian, spreading the teachings of Grotus, despite all the persecution, contempt, and misjudgment they received from others. I gladly shared this burden with them, for now I knew whose voice has whispered to me through all those years. Wait, so you couldn't even make a simple nail and you blame Torag? Are you suggesting that my problem was not a curse, just my own ability to work with metal? Or maybe you're saying that I was just too lazy. Herrick looks into your eyes defiantly, his hands trembling with suppressed rage as he runs his fingers over his beard. You're a fool if you think so, an ignorant fool. Have you ever met a dwarf who can't handle a smith's hammer? Even our children craft knives. No, no, no. Torag is the cause of my sufferings. The betrayer god deliberately cursed me just to make a laughing stock of me. Harem raises his hand and shakes his fist at someone above. But I won't let myself get angry at you, Assyrius. You're an ignorant and blind soul, and my aim is to guide you through this dying world that marches towards its end. I will open your eyes or die trying. Grotus will be pleased by either outcome. 
Let's talk about something else. What else would you like to t me to tell you, Asirius? I'd like to learn more about dwarves. Most dwarves are self-satisfied, stubborn fools serving Torag. They don't deserve my good attitude. Harem winces. But you can ask what you want to know. I'll try to answer. Tell me about the Five Kings Mountains. The Dwarven Kingdom, yes. Well, it's to the south from here. Survived many trials and there will be more yet to come. Harem strokes his beard, contemplating. There is no unity among the dwarves, Assyrius. The five kings rule over our people. They sit on their thrones of the five greatest cities, and with every passing day it grows harder for them to come to any agreement. The only thing uniting the five kings' mountains is the sky citadel of Highhelm, the great dwarven fortress at the mountain's heart. So Highhelm is among the ancient and expansive dwarven settlements recognized as a sky citadel, constructed during the Age of Darkness within and beneath lofty Emperor's, Pe Emperor's Peak in the Five Kings' range, it has remained the center of dwarven culture on Avistan for millennia. And a sky citadel, citadel is a mighty dwarven fortress that can be found throughout Avistan and Karun, the first to be built by the stout folk when they emerge under the surface world during the Age of Darkness. Although ten citadels were built in total, only a few have survived intact to the present day, and fewer still are held by the dwarves. Have the dwarves always lived on the surface? Oh no. Eons ago, all dwarves lived deep beneath the surface, and they did rather well, judging by the historic records. They built fortresses befitting noble dwarves. But our restless god, Torag, sent us a prophecy, the quest for the sky. He ordered all the dwarves to abandon their fortresses and press upwards, to show their beards to the sun, as they say. The quest for the sky is the ancient dwarven migration to the surface of Galerion from their original homes in the Darklands. Their god Torag had given them a prophecy. When the ground shook beneath their feet, they must press upward to the surface. They took the massive tremors caused by Earthfall in minus 5293 AR as the sign and began their journey towards the surface finally emerging there in minus 4987 AR, like 300 years later. This journey was long and bloody. Many dwarves perished on the way. Others turned back, keeping to their ancient strongholds, eventually to turn into evil Duragar, gray dwarves. But those who survived reached the surface and found the sky citadels, the most glorious cities in dwarven history. Tell me about the Sky Citadels. Oh, they are the peaks of creation. Glorious cities built by the ancient dwarves who'd finally reached the surface after many hardships, performing the final labor in their quest for the sky on the surface of Galarian. Harem's eyes glitter with admiration. They are steadfast, tall, magnificent. They are beautiful. The ten citadels were built by dwarves, but we've managed to keep only a few. The citadels crumbled and the orcs, sworn enemies of our people, trampled their blessed streets and ruined the gorgeous palaces of the ancient kings. Harem's eyes grow misty with tears. These were heavy losses and a disgrace to our people, Assyrius. Highhelm is the jewel of the citadels that remain. It is located in the heart of the mountains and the heart of every dwarf. Yes, yes, my heart too. There's a dwarven saying that if an enemy reaches Highhelm, every dwarf from all corners of the world will come to defend it. Harem casts a sad glance at you. I'd be there too, but not to help the Citadel's defenders. I'd be there to witness the fall of our people with my own eyes and mourn it. I would fall upon the cold stone and raise my final prayer to Grotus. I have some other questions. I'd like to talk about your god, Grotus. You wish to learn about Grotus? Harem seems surprised and pleased at the same time. Yes, of course. I will answer anything you ask. What are Grotus' teachings about in a nutshell? Grotus is the end of all that exists. Harem smiles. He's obviously been waiting for this question. Look around, Assyrius. What do you see? Look again and realize that everything will be destroyed. Our clothing and our armor will turn to dust. The walls of the palaces will crumble into ruins, the trees will fall, and you and I will die much sooner than that. Grotus is a timeless watcher. He's locked. He's locked, been locked away by Pharasma, the goddess of rebirth. 
From her boneyard, she watches o he watches over the world, knowing the time for the final reaping shall come. He's the bloated moon hanging in the sky. He's the harbinger of the last days. He's the one who will stay when all the others are gone. The boneyard, sometimes referred to as purgatory, is a neutral plane where the souls of dead mortals from the material plane are judged by the goddess Phrasma. We know about Phrasma. Phrasma has Grotus locked in her boneyard, so she is stronger than Grotus? Of course she is stronger, for now, Harem nods with dignity, stroking his beard. Grotus is weaker than Phrasma and many other gods. I would be a fool if I tried to claim otherwise. If Grotus were stronger, the end times would have already come, wouldn't they? But the power of the other gods fade away. They dissolve slowly, a grain in a century. Grotus collects those grains and waits. He doesn't need to hurry. He knows that his time shall come. Usually clerics can speak with their gods, but what does Grotus say to you? What is his will? Harem shakes his head in resignation. Grotus doesn't speak to his clerics. Actually, Grotus doesn't need any clerics. The dwarf raises his sad eyes to you. He only allows his whispers to be heard, and only by those who are dying to hear them. His words are unclear, but they call to you. His voice comes with the soft rustle of fallen leaves, with the woeful wailing wind at the mountain pass, with the roar of the raging blizzard, and it calls you to strike out on the road. Onwards, always onwards, over the pass, over the bridge and further along. Up ahead, where the edge of a grey robe flash and a candle sputtered for the last time before dying. Onwards, always onwards, until your feet can no longer carry you. Harem falls silent, submerged in his own thoughts. Uh, thanks for telling me about Grotus, I've learned enough for now. And let me ask you, what do you think about Grotus? Well, I like your tales. There's an inner truth to them. A broad smile spreads across Harem's face. I'm glad you think like that. We'll bring this truth to the whole world and tell everyone that the end is inevitable. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Have you ever regretted your decision to abandon Toreg and start worshipping Grotus instead? Your question might seem offensive, Assyrius, but I am not offended. I realize you ask it because you wish to learn more about Grotus. Harem squeezes his beard in his fist, but in a moment he lets it free again. Torag betrayed me, Assyrius. All he's ever done was look down with contempt on all my futile efforts to please him. I crafted armor plates, but they fell apart with a single strike of a fist. I smithed swords, but they broke at the hilt. Torag's priests used to say that such failures were the curse of their uncompromising deity. Harem's fingers grab his beard with such force that it seems he'll tear a handful of hair out of it. It was Grotus who opened my eyes. He showed me that failure is a manifestation of his will. The end time is near, Assyrius, and every failure is just another step towards it. Torag's curse is only half the reason for my failure. The other half is the blessing of Grotus, which I have borne from early childhood. Harem smiles warmly at his thoughts. So the short answer to your question is no. I've never regretted opening my soul to Grotus. From what I've heard, Grotus doesn't spare the minds of his clerics. They all go insane eventually. Is that true? Ha! Huh, who told you that? I'd like to look that slanderer in the eye. Harem bursts into laughter, but you can't understand what's so funny. You see, Assyria, sanity is quite a relative concept. Harem laughs, says as his laughter recedes. Each of us is certain that he's the sanest creature in the world. Meanwhile, we periodically doubt the sanity of others. So what happens if two or three people claim that someone else is insane? Does that make it true? Perhaps the accusers have lost their minds themselves. The longer a cleric listens to the whispers of Grotus, the better he comprehends the, comprehends the essence of his designs, and the deeper his understanding becomes. When enlightenment comes, the mind of a cleric ascends to a new level of understanding, which is inaccessible to simpler souls. Is it insanity? This is for you to decide, Assyrius. My decision was made long ago. When I reach enlightenment, I'll accept it with joy and delight. Well, I'm 
when to say something lawful evil. Your eagerness is commendable. Harem smiles broadly. I'm glad you noticed it. I dream that Grotus will sometimes notice my eagerness too. Thanks for the convo. We'll talk later. Harem nods with dignity. I'd be happy to continue our conversation later. Alright, so Harem is a cleric. And... Let's take a look at him. Abandon hope and embrace the inevitable end. That's the kind of speech that Harem's companion must endure every single day. A priest of Grotus, Harem left his dwarven home to spread the word of the god of end times throughout the Stolen Lands. Though if you ask me, Harem's just a whiner. One of a kind. He's a chaotic neutral cleric. He can channel positive healing to heal the living, creatures within a 30-foot burst centered on the caster. Channeling positive energy causes a burst that heals all living creatures in a 30-foot radius centered on the cleric. The amount of damage healed is equal to 1d6 points of damage plus 1d6 points of damage for every two cleric levels beyond first. So if we level him up to 3, it's 1d6 plus 1d6. So would that be 2d6? Yeah. Also, he can channel positive energy to damage the undead. Causes a burst of that damages all undead creatures in a 30 foot radius around the cleric. The amount of damage inflicted is equal to 1d6 points. Same idea. Creatures that take damage from channeled energy receive a will save to have the damage. The DC of the save is equal to 10 plus half the cleric's level plus the cleric's charisma modifier, which is zero. Touch of Chaos for one round. You can imbue a target with chaos as a melee touch attack. For the next round, any time the target rolls a d20, they must roll twice and take the less favorable result. You can use this ability a number of times per day, plus three, plus your wisdom modifier, which is four. You can use it seven times. Destructive Smite. You gain the supernatural ability to make a melee attack with a morale bonus on damage rolls equal to half your cleric level. So that's cool. He's a dwarf, which we haven't learned about yet. Dwarves are a stoic but stern race, ensconced in cities carved from the hearts of mountains and fiercely determined to repel the depredations of savage races like orcs and goblins. More than any other race, the dwarves have acquired a reputation as dour and humorless craftsmen of the earth. Could be said that dwarven history shapes the dark disposition of many dwarves, for they reside in high mountains and dangerous realms below the earth, constantly at war with giants, goblins, and other such horrors. Dwarves are a short and stocky race and stand about a foot shorter than normal humans with wide, compact bodies that account for their burly appearance. Male and female dwarves pride themselves on the length of their hair, and men often decorate their beards with a variety of clasps and intricate braids. Clean-shaven male dwarf is a sure sign of madness, or worse, no one familiar with their race trusts a beardless dwarf. His cleric proficiencies, simple weapons, light armor, medium armor, and shields. Proficient with the favored weapon of their deity, which is Grotus. We learned about channeling energy. We'll have to see what his domain selection was. Grotus. Grotus is the god of the end times. A sentient... And, oh, we learned about that. Chaos, darkness, destruction, madness. Heavy flail. So does he have a heavy flail? No, he's got a heavy mace. That's strange. Spontaneous healing. A good cleric or neutral cleric of a good deity can channel stored energy spell and healing spells that she did not prepare ahead of time. The cleric can lose any prepared spell that is not in a horizon or domain spell in order to cast any cure of the same spell level. But he's not a good cleric or a neutral cleric of a good deity. Chaos Domain. Your touch infuses life and weapons with chaos and you revel in all things anarchic. Touch of Chaos. We know about that. Chaos Blade. At 8th level, you can give your weapon you can give a weapon you touch the anarch anarchic 
special weapon quality for a number of rounds equal to half your cleric level. You can use this ability once per day at 8th level and an additional time per day every 4 levels beyond that. He revels in ruin and devastation and deliver particularly destructive attacks, so we won't get into the 8th level stuff. Let's go with light, medium, simple, shield, heavy armor. Defensive training, a four, plus 4 dodge bonus to AC against monsters of the giant subtype. Dwarves have a base speed of 20, but their speed is never modified by armor or encumbrance. Interesting. Dwarves gain a plus 4 racial bonus to their combat maneuver defense when resisting a bull rush or trip attempt while standing on the ground. Dwarves gain a plus 2 bonus on saving throws against poison spells and spell-like abilities. That's good. Dwarves gain a plus one racial bonus on attack rolls against humanoid creatures of the orc and goblinoid subtypes because of their special training against these hated foes. Dwarves are proficient with battle axes, heavy picks, and warhammers, and treat any weapon with the word dwarven as a martial weapon, but he doesn't have martial weapons. Proficiency. He's chaotic neutral. There he is. Um, um, did I? We already looked at Octavia. We didn't look at Vergangar. Let's get out of the screen and mix it up a little bit and go find. I'll go ahead. Octavia and Vergangar. Are they in here? Casting Garess. Oh, I didn't deliver. Uh, the path is clear. Purple hide yet. There they are. Octavia. Hello, Octavia smiles at you flirtatiously. Got any good news? Can you tell me about your childhood, please? Octavia sighs. Too little. Some scraps of memories. No more than that. What exactly do you remember? Octavia reflects on that, tapping her finger against her cheek. Nothing special. Some Im images of a faraway past, that's all. I do remember wooden table legs. The paint on them was peeling off and I was standing on my toes trying to peek at what was on the table. I remember the wild rose by the window. It kept me up at night, scratching the glass with its gnarled branchlets. I do remember my mother's blue dress. It was a trifle battered, but it smelled of lavender. Octavia wrinkles her forehead. I guess that's all. Not much there, right? All those memories, it's like they're not mine at all. I recall some images, and I know I should feel something about them, but I don't remember exactly what I should feel. So let them rot in a swamp with tatsel worms. Octavia grins cheerfully. My life's good enough without them. What do you know about your parents? You're a half-elf, right? Am I? Octavia examines herself and is seeing herself for the first time. You know, I think you might be right. I'm rather slim and tall, and I can see well in dim light. She raises her hand and touches her ears. Aha, they're a bit pointy. Yes, I'm definitely a half-elf. Hmm, let's think about that logically. So my mother was an elf and my father was a human. Or maybe it was the other way around and my mother was a... Finally, Octavity can't take it anymore and bursts into laughter, having spoiled her own act. So that's it. Now you know as much about my parents as I do. She sits after her laughter subsides. Do you remember how you were enslaved? I clearly remember the man took me away from my home. He was big, with a huge pot belly and shaggy beard. I was afraid he would eat me. Octavia shrugs. Anyway, he didn't stay with me long. He gave me to this slaver accomplices, and I never saw him again. When my mother was giving me to him, she was crying. I can still barely hear her quiet voice, but I can't recall her words or her face behind the tears. Just that lavender smell. It tickled my nose and I wanted to sneeze. Did my mother sell me into slavery? But then why was she crying? And if she didn't want me to be a slave, why didn't she try to save me? Octavia twirls her hair, pondering over the thought, then sighs. One more riddle from my past that I don't care to solve. Must be horrible, unable to be, recall your childhood. Oh, I recall my childhood in rather bright details. It was spent in dirty barracks. I wore flea-infested rags and slept on a straw mattress instead of a proper bed. Octavia smiles humorlessly. Though I understand what you mean. 
You know, to be honest, I'm not sure I want to remember my childhood before slavery. If I could remember what I lost, it would probably just bring me more pain. Octavia shakes her head several times and makes herself smile again. So it's good that I don't remember much of anything. I want to ask about something else. You tell me about your life in slavery? I don't like to recall it, but if you insist, Octavia frowns, the slavers from the Technic League tried to ruin my life, but all they could do was ruin my childhood. How'd you happen to find yourself in the Stolen Lands? My enslavers from the Technic League funded a large expedition into the Stolen Lands. A hundred agents, tens of slaves, wagons. We were to search for some ancient artifact or ancient ruins, Octavia shrugs. Our group never made it to the Technic League hideout. Along the way, it was attacked by the future owner of the Stolen Lands himself, and I'll be forever grateful to him for it. Octavia winks cheerfully. Did you have many masters over the years? Yes, many of them. Some owned me for years, others felt they had enough of me in a couple of months. Trust me, I did all I could to make every master eager to get rid of me. A slave that's trained in magic is a rather expensive thing, so they wouldn't kill me. At least that was the hope. So I drooled and played an idiot. And I listened as every new master argued with my former one, trying to return me. Sometimes I punctured the pages of magic books I, I was forced to copy with the quill. Other times I pretended to mix up the spells, so instead of lighting a magic torch, I set dozens of dancing lights floating just below the ceiling. Of course, most of these tricks of mine usually ended badly. I got punished on a regular basis. My back still remembers the master's whips, though all my scars from those times are long gone. Where'd you learn to use magic? Oh, I was taught ma magic by Janush of Starfall, one of the most famous wizards in Numeria. Maestro Janus, as he insisted on calling himself. Octavia's voice overflows with contemptuous sarcasm. Anyone would be happy to learn from such a great master, and only a talentless bitch like me would dare to reject his teachings and indulge in her laziness. Starfall is a city just as brutal and harsh as the unforgiving Numerian land that it is capital of. The place is a mockery of the soft capitals of the south, with a level of decadence which would put even Taldor to shame. The decadence is surrounded by the filthy reek of human misery. Here the black sovereign, Kivoth Kool, rules at the whim of the Technic League, while the rest of the city suffers under his harsh rule. At least that's what Maestro Janus used to repeat constantly while whipping knowledge into my back. The great maestro was a big fan of punishment. Octavia's lips press into a thin line. The Technic League didn't care if a few slaves died under the master's whip as long as Maestro Janush proved an arcane trained one in return. Officially, there's no slavery in Numeria, but the Technic League is above any law. A slave with an aptitude for the arcane is worth much more than a regular one. The slave's repertoire is limited to the simplest and safest spells, of course. Have you ever tried to run away? What a silly question. Of course I tried. As soon as we saw even the tiniest opportunity to get free, Reg and I grabbed for it. On one occasion, we jumped from the cart into the river. There was a time when we spent weeks trying to dismantle the far wall of the barracks and make a path out. Sometimes we attacked our guards when they least expected it. We craved freedom. We lived only to dream about it. Those short days, sometimes weeks, that we spent on the run were the happiest days of my life. We used to hide in the woods or blend in with the crowd on the streets of Starfall. Midnight stars were our guiding lights, and we shared our dream with them to reach the river kingdoms. For in these lands, there were neither slaves nor masters. We were starving and freezing, but that was the real life. Too bad it usually ended too soon. The Technic League agents always found us in the end. I don't know how they managed to do it. They probably used magic, or maybe it was just our fate. They whipped us and returned us to our old masters, or sold us to new ones. The old ones refused to pay. So we were slaves again, but the dream about the River Kingdoms never left our hearts. Have your masters ever hurt you? You figured that out, didn't you? Octavia narrows her eyes. Or maybe you want to hear about all the beatings I survived. The humiliations I've endured. Imagine the worst thing one person can do to another and multiply it tenfold. That's what happened to me nearly every day in slavery. Masters. Oh, wow, I hate that word. Octavia shakes her head furiously, making her locks dance. They punished me because they wanted to hurt me. But what hurt even more was the mere fact of their existence. Let's talk about something else. Octavia stops you, gently touching your hand. Wait, I... I want to tell you. 
She sighs and shakes her head as if trying to collect her thoughts. The Technic League agents you rescued us from. Reg and I tried to run away many times, but they always managed to find us eventually. I have no reason to ha hope that this time they've lost track of us for good. I won't let anyone harm those who are dear to me. Whatever happens, you can count on me. Octavia raises her eyes to you and gives you such a warm smile that you're unable to not smile back. In the depths of her eyes, you notice something that wasn't there before. This unnamed feeling hides in a moment, but you're sure you know that it was trust. Thank you, Octavia whispers, touching your shoulder. Suddenly she frowns in contemplation, twirling her locks. Still, I'd like to find them first. Wow, lots of chatting. Hope you guys are enjoying this. Learning about the characters. What kind of relationship do you have with Ragongar? Octavia shrugs awkwardly. We're together, she answers simply. The way you said to get we're together sounded unconvincing. Is something wrong? You've noticed? Well, I didn't mean that. Now I'll have to explain. Octavia shakes her head. Not sure I know how to put it correctly. You see, Reg seems to treat me like his property. He's always kind to me and it feels good when we travel together or when we share a blanket at the campsite. But he always calls me my Octavia. I told him over and over that I don't belong to anyone, that I'm my, my, I'm my own, and I stay with him by my own free will. He only grins when I say that. I bet he likes to think that I'm his. Never mind, though. I'll sort it out somehow. Octavia shakes her head, making the troubling thoughts go away. Never mind. I'll sort it out somehow. Octavia shakes her head, making the troubling thoughts go away. When did you meet, Reg? Years ago, when I was studying magic at Maestro Janus's, Reg was his student too, though you couldn't actually say he was really studying anything. Reg has his own ways to cast spells. He never needed the Maestro's instructions. You see, unlike Wizard, Reg draws his power directly from his innate bloodline abilities. Janus didn't realize the nature of Reg's powers when he took the young boy as his new student, and when he finally understood them, he just taught the negligent half-orc to control his powers to avoid harming himself or others. Reg and I have been together ever since. We could both use magic, but more importantly, we both crave freedom. We used to vow to each other that someday we'd break free from the unbearable captivity or die trying, together. Octavia gives you a warm smile. I guess it's good that we fulfilled only the first part of that vow. You owe him much? Octavia winces. I don't like this O word. I don't owe anything to anybody. Everything I do, I do of my own free will. But to answer your question, yes, Reg has done a lot for me. I can't count how many times he was whipped by masters because of me, how many times he took the blame for my doings. He never complained when they dragged him, beaten and covered in blood to the slave barracks. He just groaned and clenched his fists while I bandaged his wounds with the scraps of my filthy clothing. We've always been together, my whole life, as slaves and as free people. It would, I wouldn't be me if not for him. The fact that Reg is so impulsive doesn't bother you? Ah, that. That is a very delicate matter, Octavia winces, looking away. Reg means a lot to me, and he endured a lot for me, but some parts of him just scare me. He becomes extremely bloodthirsty when it comes to slavers. Don't get me wrong, I hate slavers with all my heart, and I'll do a lot to cleanse the world of their filth. But Reg, he'd do anything. Understand? Absolutely anything. I'm afraid that anger might kill everything good in him. I've attempted to talk to him about it many times, but he just won't listen. He becomes angry after our conversations. Octavia sighs sadly. Let's change the subject. Of course, what do you want to talk about? I just have to ask, how do you manage to look so gorgeous even when we're out in the middle of nowhere? Oh, so you've noticed, Octavia smiles slyly. My appearance is the result of daily effort, and it's not easy. Do you know how much time it makes, how much time it takes to create good makeup or to mend a dress, even with the help of magic? So if someday you wake up early, an hour before dawn or so, you can actually check on me. You'll see how I prepare myself for a new day. Oh, 
O oh, Octavia, the flower of the stolen lands, you're as beautiful as you are dangerous. You strike down monsters with your spells, and you strike down people with your beauty. Let's say that. You're a real sweet talker. I feel all flushed. Octavia fans herself with a hand. Well now, I have to pay even more attention to my looks, for now I know for sure there's someone who appreciates my efforts. You worship Calistria, right? Yes, many slaves survive only thanks to their faith. Some lived hoping for a day when a good deity would deliver them. Some even offer deals to the evil gods, but me and Reg, Calistria has taught us the most important things. Expect no gifts from above. Rely only on ourselves. Never forgive those who wronged us. But at the same time, savor every droplet of pleasure we could squeeze from our bleak days. It's amazing how after all your hardships, you still remain so cheerful and optimistic. Octavia's smile fades a little. I try not to view my life as a never-ending course of sufferings. Yes, I've had my share of hard times, but do I need to recall them? After all, along with the bad things, I had some good things as well. I had a dream and I followed it, and eventually it came true. Following that path, I met Reg and you. Now I'm free and surrounded by friends. Octavia's voice trembles with hidden emotions, but her smile remains warm and sincere. Why do you need to find the Technic League agents? I broke free from slavery. Thanks to you, I've, I've obtained everything I've dreamed of, my freedom and the opportunity to control my own life. I want to use this opportunity to fight the Technic League, at least the part of it that operates here in the Stolen Lands. I wish to free all the slaves from their Technic League masters. Octavia gives you a swarm, warm smile and gently touches your hand. I do believe that while we're together, we can achieve a lot, even this. All right, we'll talk later. Sure, Octavia gives you a friendly smile. Come anytime. All right, I'm going to rest. And poor Vergangar, for the sake of this video, it's already been quite a long one. Um, are we close to leveling up? Thousand. Uh, well, let's meet Ragongar. What do you want? Have a little chat? Alright, it's not like we have anything better to do. Tell me about yourself. What is there to know? I was born. I'm alive. I haven't died yet. That enough for you? Do you remember your childhood? Ragongar scowls. What a crap question. I was just a kid when they sold me. Before that, I don't remember much. Smoky fires, stinky hides... Always bumping along on a horse. I think I was born in one of the Kelid tribes of Numeria. There are many. Some survive on their own. Some give up their pride and serve the Technic League. Guess mine was one of the cowards if they sold their own kids. I remember my father's hands. Rough, scarred, white. So I guess I get this green skin from my mother. But I don't remember her. I think I remember playing with another half orc child. A brother, maybe. For some reason, they didn't sell him, just me. Father gave him his dagger to play with. Never gave it to me. Ugh, I don't want to remember. Forget all this. I'm an orphan. Ragongar waves his hand wryly. I grew up a slave. That I remember well. So many things burned in my memory. Most of all, I remember her. My Octavia. Today, we're almost the same age, but back then she was twice as young as me. Just a child. But a brave one. Cunning. Bold. And beautiful. The most beautiful girl in the world. What deity do you worship? Ha! I've never got much help from the gods so far, but if you make me choose, I'd say Calistria. Who else could I worship? The savored Sting, the goddess of pleasure, fun, and revenge. Oh, yes. Calistria, also known as the savored Sting and the unquenchable fire, is the goddess of lust and revenge, who takes on many faces and guises. She's held in especially high regard by elves, who often identify with her mercurial moods and changeable nature. Fondness for wasps hath earned this vengeful deity the title of Savored Sting. Such creatures live on after harming their enemies, a trait Calistria's followers hope to emulate when pursuing their goals. Just finishing up my coffee here. Where'd you get your magical powers? What magical powers? The hell are you talking about? Oh, you mean these? Ragongar makes lightning run over his hands with a contented smile, then snaps his fingers, invoking a shower of blinding sparks. I've had them since I was born. At least one thing I can thank my scum parents for. 
Maybe these powers are why they sold me to slavery. Think they were scared? Who knows? Damn the Marians. At the Technic League, they drew my blood, did experiments, burned me with fire, tortured me with cold, electricity. And they told me, you won't believe it. They told me I have blue dragon blood in my veins. Not bad, huh? I'm a dragon, you freaks. Come check my blood if you dare. Grinning, Ragongar strikes his palm with a fist, and another fountain of electric sparks shoots upwards. What do your tattoos mean? They are magical. They help me control my powers. The Technic League gave them to me. I'd hoped that somewhere in my body there was at least one sign left of my tribe, but no. I guess they didn't care to bother. To hell with them. They better hope I never find them. If I ever meet my father, I will leave even the score between us. How do you manage to use both the sword and magic and not cut off your fingers? Haha, <laughs> hmm, it's simple. I'm just that bloody good. The half fork gives a contented grin. You enjoy making people suffer? Pfft, why should I care about their suffering? I do what I want. If I step on someone's to toes, then they shouldn't have put themselves in my way. But chasing someone down just to torture them? That's only entertainment for maniacs like the Technic League. Well, on second thought, huh, hmm. For them, I would make an exception. I'd love to watch as I fry them nice and slow. But why do you ask? Do my methods shock you? Ragongar clenches his fist, buzzing with sparks, and laughs loud loudly at his jokes. How about some chaotic evil? Very amusing, and you're right, if someone gets in your way, it's their own fault. That's what I say, there's too many freaks who don't understand, just asking to be run through with a sword. Sometimes I'm casting a spell, looking at another fool, thinking, you idiot, what the hell are you doing? You'd still be alive if you weren't standing in my way. None of this had to happen. And then, bam, they're dead. I have to clean some more blood from my shirt. Thanks for your answers. Tell me about your life in Numeria. You mean my life as a slave? I didn't see much except for the slave barracks and the League's twisted laboratories. How did you happen to become a slave? I was sold by my own tribe when I was just a little brat. The half orc clenches his teeth and spits on the ground and steps on it with his boot. So I grew up in a slave barracks. I was raised to be sold like a battle animal. They tried to break me, but they picked the wrong brat. No matter how much you beat this animal, he only gets angrier. The half-orc punches himself in the chest and snarls. Why did your masters teach you magic? Can't you guess? Because magic is in my blood. It's why they bought me. I wasn't raised as some lowly mop slave, but as a murder machine. I'd fetch quite a nice sum of gold. You might also ask if they knew I'd take the first opportunity to rip their own guts out using everything they taught me. Huh. Of course they did, but that's the Technic League. They calculate risk. Octavia kept pretending to be simple-minded so they wouldn't expect anything of her. But I made every effort, though they didn't teach me much. What is there to teach? It's not book magic, it's innate. They made me practice with my sword more, but I did my best in everything. I studied all I could. They knew they were raising an enemy, but they thought they could keep me on a short leash or sell me to someone with deep pockets, so I'd become someone else's problem. But who won in the end, huh? Who is free? Who will bury them all? The half-orc makes an obscene gesture in the northwestern direction towards Numeria. What else did you see beyond your life in chains? What could I have seen? Well, when we ran, we went through Starfall. That's a fine city, big, loud, many merchants, things to see, things to steal. But I didn't have much chance to walk around. It's the very nest of the sodding Technic League. We were focused more on getting out alive. We met some barbarians. I asked them who might know what tribe I'm from, but they didn't know anything. I don't have any tribal tattoos. Nothing. Actually, they are all right. Well, some of them. The Bloodgars, for one. They're great. All the rivers are theirs. We sailed with them during one of our escapes, almost all the way to Brevoy. <laughs> and they didn't turn us in. But the White Scars got us after that. Those guys are shit. They've sold their pride to the Technic League. Oh, one more thing. One time Octavia and I tried to escape and stumbled across a Numerian monster. I'll never forget it. A huge spider the size of a house, made of metal. Spitting fire, shooting deadly rays all around. That thing could probably even tear a dragon to pieces. Ruined our escape plans too. We had to go back. Did you and Octavia try to escape? What do you think? Of course we tried. I stopped counting how many times. Jumped from windows, dug tunnels, choked out guards, or seduced them. 
That happened too. Haha. <laughs> hmm. But those dirt bags caught us every time. Every bloody time. My back was covered with whip scars. Lucky we were prized property. They'd spent too much gold on us to kill us. Anyone else would be hung and forgotten. But they kept trying to break us and recoup their expenses. I don't know whether I could, could have survived by sheer stubbornness if it weren't for Octavia. I probably couldn't have. I would have just given up and died. But I had to pull my girl out of that meat grinder. And she... She believed in me and had enough hope for both of us. When I lay there with my back slashed to pieces, she whispered to me about the River Kingdoms, where there's no slavery, where everyone can go whatever they want and take whatever they want. I'll be damned, but I thought she was just making this up to keep our hopes alive, and now it turns out to be true. All of it, every last word. No chains, no slaves, no laws, just live and be happy. Is slavery legal in Numeria? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. There are some laws against it, but even in Starfall, a third of the people live in bondage, and that's the capital. In a region where the Black Sovereign's hand doesn't reach, they hold the tribal customs instead of laws. The barbarians don't keep slaves, instead they have thralls. Big bloody difference. And on top of that, on top of all that mess, there's a Technic League. Law and custom mean nothing to those slime balls. They just take whatever and whoever they want. Thank you for your answers. Ask away. What kind of relationship do you have with Octavia? Well, my Octavia and I don't have a relationship. We have a life together. How did you meet? Back when we were children, we were taken as apprentices by a great spellmaster, Janush. Maestro Janush, he called himself. He was our teacher. Well, he made Octavia read books and memorize spells. I have my own innate magic. He trained me a bit, taught me how to control my gifts so I wouldn't lose control and incinerate myself like a dumbass. Oh, teacher, we will meet again. There's one more test I must pass. But you were asking about my Octavia. We've been together all our lives. We learned everything together. How to weave magic and how to survive. And as we grew older, we learned how to love. Without each other, we would never have gotten out of there, that's for sure. We would have given up and surrendered to death. But together, that's a very different story. Not the first time and not the tenth, but eventually we made it out. Why do you call her yours? She doesn't seem to like that very much. My girl loves freedom so much and even a slight chance of losing it frightens her. She's so smart. You really think she feels like I'm trying to make her mine, like an apple stolen out of the market? Me, who was skinned alive for trying to help her escape? If she's afraid of the word mine, it's because she doesn't understand the difference between my boots and my heart. But she will understand, sooner or later. Are you and Octavia faithful to each other? Octavia and I are connected, and this connection cannot be broken. We grew into each other, you know? Jealousy is for weak cowards who don't trust each other and are scared of being tricked. If a knight on the sides threatens your love, that just means there was no real love there to begin with. She and I are together, to the end, and will never part from each other. So when she likes some lad or some lass, it's no drama to me. I just ask her what, whether she wants me to leave them alone or join in. And she does the same, haha. <laughs> What, are you judging us? Or maybe, maybe you just want to join us in our tent, hmm? The half-orc grins. Is that an invitation? <laughs> well then, maybe I will. Is that so? Haha, <laughs> hmm. Ragangar measures you with an openly lustful look. I will think about it. Oh boy, I was hoping more for Octavia, but thank you for your answers. I have to go. So long. If you want to know anything else, just ask. Don't be shy. Just don't go pale when I answer. <laughs> Alright, so... Down the stairs as we go. We've met all the new comrades. We know the mission that lays ahead of us. We have to enter Sycamore Hall. We're gonna have to buy... So we have six people. We have... three camping rations, so we need three more. So that's six, that's one rest. Two, three, four, five, six, that's two. 
two, three, four, five, six. That's three. Not counting hunting. So let's deal. Um, let's go over here and talk to uh, Bakken. So he's giving us a discount on potions and stuff. So let's let's do an inventory check. Harem came with some stuff, cure light wounds, inflict light wounds. So I'm thinking of taking Harem back to the dungeon. But I think I'd have to replace Lindsay, unfortunately. Because Harem, she has a lot of knowledge and persuasion, and mo she has mobility. Here, minus eight mobility, perception, religious lore, human lore. She's got trickery, but Octavia's got trickery. And also knowledge and mobility. So we have to replace Lindsay with Harem. The reason I want to do that is because he can damage undead. And uh, when we fight those skeletons. So I'm going to go back and face Tartuk or enter Sycamore Hall and see what happens. And then I'm going to head back down and just clean out Sycamore Caves with those three skeletons. And I think Harem would be best to, uh, to do that with. So I'm going to quick save and try to at least level him up. Go with Cleric. More than capable of upholding the honor of their deities in battle, clerics often prove stalwart and capable combatants. Their true strength, strength lies in their ability to draw capability to draw upon the power of their deities, whether to increase their own and their allies' prowess in battle, to vex their foes with divine magic, or to lend healing to companions in need. As their powers are influenced by their faith, all clerics must focus their worship on a divine source. Alright. Two points to spend. Well, religious lore. And, um. I don't know, do we really need more? Persuasion? Can he. Demoralized person? No, he can treat affliction. Means to tend to a single disease or poison character and make a lore religion check. If your check exceeds the DC of the affliction, the affliction is removed. You can treat each character only once per day. Well, I guess perception. Got good wisdom, good constitution, some strength. Um, he's got guidance as well. And level one spells. That will come in very handy. So he doesn't choose spells that level up. He um, gets them automatically and then he can just prepare them. Alright, so what do we want to give Harem here? How about extra channel where you can channel energy two additional times per day? I think that's pretty good for him. He can heal energy two times and inflict negative energy two times. I think that's a pretty good steel soul. You're especially resistant to man magic. You receive a plus four racial bonus on saving throws against spell and spell-like abilities. It replaces the normal bonus from the dwarf's hardy trait. They normally receive 
plus two bonus on spells. Well, that's really sweet, too. <clears throat> I think for right now we're going to extra channel. Alright, so he gains new spells, level two spells. Including Lesser Restoration. Inflict Wounds so he can heal. Jayathal. Even cure moderate to damage undead creatures. 2d8 points of damage. Will half if used to damage. We'll say so. Alright, so now he's leveled up. Gonna have to leave Lindsay behind. We'll miss her inspire competence. Let's make sure we're ready to go here. Potions. Oh yeah, I was gonna do an inventory check. So she has no potions. He's got a couple healing. She's got a healing and a bark skin and an enlarged person. Forgot she had that wand of true strength. She's not wearing any armor, so she's going to have to get the Bracers of Armor plus one. Sorry, Lindsay. You shall return, I'm sure. In our shared stash, we have a Blur, Vark Skin, a Shield of Faith, a Healing Potion, no Alchemist Fire or Acid speak of. Let's get some potions of... Let's get another bark skin. Let's get a cure moderate wound potion. And, oh, I'm not selling those. No, 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 no. 450. I think we're pretty good with that. I think that makes sense. Alright. So. We have to prepare Harem's spell book. So he's got True Strike as a domain slot. He's got Bless, Bane, and... Oh, I don't know. Lindsay had removed fear. Right? Yep. So we're going to have to give him remove fear. In case we get feared. Level 2 domain slot. Bone Shaker. I like this spell. One enemy within medium range. Fortitude half. You take control of a living target creature skeleton. A creature has its skeleton rattle within its flesh, causing it grievous harm. Target takes 3d6 points of damage, plus 1d6 additional points for two caster levels. So, 4d6, and a fortitude halves that, so that's a good spell. Full strength. Subject becomes stronger, grants a plus four enhancement bonus to strength, adding the usual benefits to melee attack rolls, damage rolls, and other uses of strength modifier. We have to give that so we can give that to a Miri or Jayathal. And, um. How about. and turns, plus four bonus to constitution, benefits to hit point, fortitude saves, constitution checks, and more. Um, 
Let's throw a cure moderate wounds in there. So the journal says we are 68 days and 14 hours. Almost one month, so let's rest so the spellbook's prepared. And we are off back to Old Sycamore. Hopefully finding Tartuccio is going to be worth it. And we didn't waste all this time with our bitter rival. And we should be able to take on those skeleton champions, that's for sure. We have multiple ways of inflicting damage on undead, from harem, his negative energy, the telekinetic fist of Octavia, Jayathal's disrupt undead, so... That will be the gang for now. Going to quick save, and I think I'm going to end this episode here. It's been a bit short, I've taken a couple breaks, but we did do a lot of talking. We learned about our characters. Let's at least get back to Old Sycamore in one piece. 16 hours, are we traveling heavy? No. It's just a long journey. I'm going to try to evade the random encounters. I don't think they provide a lot of XP anyway. Most of the time, unless we fight like something tough. Which would leave us wounded for this battle. I should have fought that actually. Stop trying to evade because now I have many ways to heal. He can channel his divine energy. How many times? The end draws near. Five. Five negative, so. He has plenty of ways to heal. Oh, we don't have Lindsay's healing anymore, though, so that's an important distinction to make. So we're just going to enter Sycamore Hall. going. I don't know. Up, upwards. And uh, I'll leave it off there. I know there wasn't a ton of action in this episode. There's a lot of talking. A lot of... Oh, snap. Phylocenes. We can handle them. One. Just file the scenes. Give the order. Oh my gosh, there's tons of them. I was not expecting this many of them. Wow. And it was very easy. Well, maybe we can get some pelts to sell. Five pounds and they're only worth two. Nah, we'll take the meat, it's worth ten. We'll leave the pelts behind, they're a little heavy. So we haven't been up this way? There's new stuff up here. I've spotted something. Good job with it. Uh a serious. Wand of ear piercing scream. And four alchemist fire is perfect. Let's get the inventories managed here. Valerie can use the cure moderate. A reduced person. Bark skin. Jayathal. Miri. You can use the wand of magic missile easily. And the wand of ear piercing scream easily, but so can Sirius. 
You can, yep. Have a potion. Give him a uh, bark skin. Give her the bracers of armor. Give him a shield of faith potion. A Mary. I'll just throw the blur on there. And that would pretty much be it. Well, at least we got to fight some phylacenes. A whole gang of them. 900 away from level up. Is this the Mites residence? Yep. They look funny. Pointed noses. So we're gonna get right to Sycamore Hall. But at least we got to know the companions. Um, we learned about Harem's god Grotus and his path through life that we can reflect on. We learned about Octavia and the trouble she went through and her relationship with Ragongar. And we learned a bit about Ragongar, that he's a powerful warrior and use both magic and blades. I'll go ahead. May have to check him out later. Even invited to their tent, but uh, hopefully that's more with uh, Octavia, clear. less with Ragongar. So Sycamore Hall is right here. So Purple Hide may be behind this door. He may have left already. We will find out in the next episode. So this was episode 9. Hope you enjoyed. Our kobold... What's going on? I don't know why my keyboard is acting so funky. Hope you enjoyed our little kobold ex exploits at the beginning and then learning about the companions and doing some inventory and stuff. So we are fully prepared and then after we uh, go through here, before we leave, we're going to check out those three skeletons in the secret room. I think we can handle them quite easily. Now, so uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next episode, which will be action packed. So stay tuned for that. So long, everybody. Peace out.